1969 was a historic and tumultuous year. The Boeing 747 flew its maiden flight. The Cuyahoga River caught fire. Campus unrest blanketed the nation. The United States began withdrawal of troops from Vietnam. 400,000 youth camped for four days at the Woodstock Music Festival. The Manson family killed seven victims in Los Angeles. Man walked on the moon, the Mets the and the New York Amazing Mets upset the Baltimore Orioles in five games in the World Series. And in 1969, the Washington State Court of Appeals was born. Fifty years later, the Washington Court of Appeals, the state's intermediate appellate court, still serves its function as the workhorse of the Washington appellate court system. This year, 2019, we celebrate the 50th anniversary of the court. Ladies and gentlemen, I have been informed that the jury has reached a verdict. So I would ask, would the presiding juror please stand and identify yourself? Julie O'Rourke. Ms. O'Rourke, has the jury reached a verdict? Yes, we have. Will you please hand the verdict forms to the bailiff? A trial does not end a case's judicial process. Under American law, a loser has a right to appeal. In the Superior Court of the State of Washington for Frank All state judicial state systems and the federal judicial system started with one appellate court, the State Supreme Court and the United States Supreme Court. But throughout the 20th century, appellate courts experienced significant increases in workload as a result of population growth, expanded post-conviction and appellate rights in criminal cases, increases in legislation and government regulation, and a societal trend toward resolving social and economic controversies through the legal system. The burgeoning workload resulted in a backlog of appellate cases and a growing lack of confidence in the judicial system. The Supreme Court of the State of Washington is now in session. By the 1920s, the Washington State Supreme Court, as the only appellate court, was overloaded with work flowing from the superior courts. Back in the 1930s, uh, a very prominent lawyer Al Schweppe, who had been a former dean of the University of Washington Law School, made a speech, I think at that time he was president of the State Bar Association, that we need an intermediate court of appeals in the state of Washington because the, the Supreme Court is just uh, has such a load that they're having difficulty keeping up. That was in the 1930s. In 1967, the Washington State Legislature sent to the Washington citizenry a proposal to establish the Washington State Court of Appeals. With the proposal, Washington would join many other states in establishing an intermediate appellate court in order to reduce the workload of the state Supreme Court. The United States added its intermediate appellate court, the United States Circuit Court of Appeals, in 1891. On November 5, 1968, Washington voters approved a state constitutional amendment that authorized the state Court of Appeals. Governor Dan Evans made the initial appointments to the court with all judges facing election at the general election and of I 1970. And I remember that one pretty clearly because uh, Bill Gisberg, who was chairman of the Judiciary Committee in the Senate, and Wes Ullman, a young uh, lawyer from Seattle who was also uh, in, a senator, came down to see me. And Bill Gisberg said, uh, Governor, um, you know, how do you intend to make appointments on the Court of Appeals? Uh, he said, uh, you know, we don't have to make them happen right away. We could let them all go to the first election. But uh, I'd prefer not to do that. And uh, he was just asking how I would do it. And I said, well, Bill, uh, probably I'll appoint more who have a Republican background than Democrat. But uh, what I will really do is pay attention to the Bar Association, their recommendations, and uh, we were pretty careful uh, on that. We had plenty of applicants, some of them superb, some of them uh, not so superb, but uh, we made the appointments. Uh, they were all 
received pretty well, and in the first election, which had to occur fairly immediately, not one of the 12 was even opposed, so that made me feel pretty good. Judge Jerome Ferris, one of the first judges of the Washington State Court of Appeals, serves today as a judge on the United States Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. Most of us met for the first time when we were gathered to be appointed to this court, and yet we became very close friends. It was almost remarkable how close we came and how much we cared about each other. Not too long after it was formed, the Division II of the Court of Appeals had their courtroom at the Tacoma Mall office building. Justice Pearson and Harold Petrie, who was a good friend of mine, they told me they wanted to make sure that Division II had the first published decision of the Court of Appeals. And uh, the inaugural ceremony, swearing-in ceremony, was on September 8, 1969. And the Division Two of the Court of Appeals issued their first decision in a case that's in the Volume One of Washington Appellate R Reports at page one, and it's uh, it was issued on September 10th. That's two days after the inaugural ceremony. So I'm assuming they had argument on September 9th, and uh, and issued their opinion the next day, September 10th. It was an interesting time because we had, to, we had to decide, well, what are we going to do? Can we, we're six of us in Seattle, can we sit in Spokane sometimes? Can Spokane lawyers, judges sit in Seattle sometimes? We took the position, if it's not prohibited and if it's constitutional, we can do it. So we did do it. We, uh, we didn't, we didn't try to rotate through the court initially the full time, but we tried to make sure that the judges over in Spokane got to sit with our division and that the judges from Coma got to sit with us. And then we would sit with them. One of us would go and sit with, with them. And we, we, so we worked out the rules ourselves. All of the judges in the court had a, a real sense of mission. That is, they knew this was a new institution, and they took great pride in being members of that institution, but appreciated uh, the, uh, the task ahead of them, which was to establish uh, the reputation of the court as a credible institution uh, that did uh, uh, fine legal work and had a sense of what the law was, because they were going to be, uh, as you know, the court of last resort for many cases only a fraction of which would go to the state Supreme Court. The three divisions of the Court of Appeals are cleverly called Division I, Division II, and Division III. Appeals are heard in the division in which the trial court originating the case is situated, but can be transferred to another division if necessary. Division I sits in Seattle and is the smallest of the three geographic divisions, though the largest by population. Division II sits in Tacoma. Division III sits in Spokane and includes three-fifths of the state's land area. Although each division has a courthouse and headquarters in its largest city, the respected divisions often conduct hearings outside its courthouse and county courthouses or colleges. An anomaly occurs with regard to the superior courts of Skamania and Klickitat County served by one judge. You know, what's unique about my position is that um, I have decisions that are decided by two different uh, appellate courts. Uh, my Klickitat County decisions are reviewed by Division Three, which is over in Spokane, while my Skamania County decisions are reviewed by Division Two, which is up in Tacoma. Each division is divided into three districts. Judges are elected from the districts. The term for Court of Appeals judges is six years. If a judge retires in midterm, the state governor appoints a replacement. The replacement must stand for election to retain his or her seat and complete the rest of the term, usually at the next general election. From its inception, the Court of Appeals has benefited Washington State. 
Oh, it's been a real success and almost immediately because the establishment of the Court of Appeals took uh, away from the Supreme Court that huge overload that they had. It redistributed the workload and uh, the most important thing is that people who had problems, judicial problems, had their problems solved more rapidly, which was to the betterment of everyone. There's no doubt that it made the effect the Supreme Court wanted. We got a majority of the cases, and the Supreme Court then, I don't mean they retired, they had plenty of work and pretty good, but they got the, the cases that should go to the Supreme Court. And we, we handled most of the appeals. And uh, everybody was happy with the system. I don't think anybody was ever unhappy with the State Court of Appeals. If the loser in Superior Court, the trial court, wishes to appeal, the appeal goes to the Washington State Court of Appeals. A party has one right to an appeal. That appeal is to the Court of Appeals, not the Supreme Court. The Court of Appeals must hear all cases appealed to it from the Superior Courts. The loser in the Court of Appeals may seek review by the Washington State Supreme Court, which sits in Olympia. Unlike the appeal to the Court of Appeals, review is not a right and the State Supreme Court need not accept the case. For most litigants, when an opinion is issued in this court, it's the end. Uh, litigants have a right to ask the Supreme Court to take their case and review it. But it's not a right of appeal like the right to appeal to the Court of Appeals. Part of the reason we don't accept very many cases is because the Court of Appeals has done a good job. And even in the cases we have accepted, it's not that they haven't done a good job, but that there might be a need for us to speak in the first instance. There might be a need for a definitive answer. The Supreme Court has the final say as to what constitutes Washington state law. The Supreme Court takes only about 100 cases a year. And those, because there are conflicts between divisions of the court or because there is a novel issue or maybe it's one of those few things that was reserved in the Constitution to go directly to the Supreme Court. And so it's the one opportunity for people to appeal to a higher court and say, did I get a fair shake at the trial court? The Washington Court of Appeals hears about 1,500 cases each year. The Court of Appeals is the workhorse for the appellate courts. The Court of Appeals is the workhorse of the appellate court system. We're the workhorse. <laughs> we're, the, we're just the... <laughs> the appellate process begins when the losing party files a notice of appeal. The notice must be filed within 30 days of the final decision of the Superior Court. The losing party is responsible to pay for the clerk's file and the transcript of the trial to be sent from the Superior Court to the Court of Appeals. After the Superior Court record arrives at the Court of Appeals, the losing party files an opening brief. A month later, the winning party files a brief. The losing party then may file a reply brief. The Court of Appeals is much more than its judges. Each Court of Appeals division employs a court administrator who also serves as chief clerk. The clerk's office employs numerous case managers. It involves a myriad of different uh, areas of responsibility, case management, personnel, uh, budgeting, facilities, uh, uh, pretty much anything that needs to be done other than process cases. The Court of Appeals, like other institutions, endeavors to go paperless. Everything used to come in paper, and now I would say probably 90 to 95 percent of the documents that are transmitted from the trial court are transmitted to us electronically. These updated and uh, modern case management systems will allow the public as well as the courts to have better access to this information. Court commissioners also serve each Court of Appeals division. A court commissioner handles the court's motion docket. Um, there are numerous issues that can arise before the court actually considers the case. Those issues come before the commissioner as motions by the party, 
and the commissioner decides the motion after um, um, reviewing any written memoranda that the parties file on that particular issue, and they also have an opportunity for oral argument. The Washington State Court of Appeals, Division Three, is now in session. The Honorable Robert E. Warren Ferry. We like to consider ourselves an error correcting court, so we don't start from the beginning. We take cases and decisions that have been heard below and then we review those decisions to make sure that they are legally sound. All of the witnesses have testified below in the uh, Superior Court or sometimes in the District Court and we get their testimony by way of written transcript and so we read all of the testimony that they have given but we don't take original testimony. We don't have a jury box, we don't have, even have a witness stand. The Washington Court of Appeals hears every type of case except capital cases, from cases resol resolving credit card disputes all the way to aggravated murder cases, divorces, real estate disputes, controversies about elections, what should be on the ballot, and anything else you can imagine that someone could ask a Superior Court judge to decide. And sir, at this point, what did Peter say to you? Objection. Hearsay. Sustained. At the end of a jury trial, the Superior Court judge instructs the jury as to the law to apply to the case. The appellate court reviews whether the law in the jury instructions was correct. We instruct you on the law that you are to apply here. I will actually be reading these instructions to you. You can take notes if you wish, but you will be provided with a copy of these instructions in the jury room. A Superior Court judge may dismiss a case before trial or during trial on legal grounds. The appellate court decides whether those dismissals were correct. Uh, Mr. Davis, uh, I have to agree with you. There are genuine issues of material fact. The summary judgment motion is denied. Superior Court judges must make decisions quickly and therefore many welcome review by the Court of Appeals of their decisions. As a trial court judge, you're kind of doing things at a much quicker pace, uh, uh, making those decisions. Um, so I understand it's uh, required, you know, very necessary to have those appellate courts go back and look over the decisions as trial court judges are making, which are happening much quicker um, based upon the size of the dockets and the types of the issues that come up before them. Um, and as I was told by uh, d different justices and different judges out there, um, you know, you're really not a real true judge until you've had one of your decisions reviewed and you've been overturned by one of the appellate courts. The Court of Appeal sits in rotating panels of three judges. Cases are assigned randomly to the panels and one of the panel members is randomly chosen to write the opinion. Each judge has two law clerks. One of the author's law clerks reviews the trial record and prepares a pre-hearing memorandum for the three panel members. Primarily a law clerk reads through the briefs that have been filed for a particular case. We read through the trial court record and we research the relevant law in the area and we summarize all of that in a memo that we write for the judges. When the, the briefs of the parties come up at the beginning of each term, um, the law clerk has the job of taking the first look at the briefs uh, for me and then um, first writing a very quick summary of what's involved so I can get an overview of what's coming up in the next six weeks and then um, writing a more extensive memorandum, we call it a pre-hearing memorandum, that summarizes the arguments that the parties are making, um, reads the cases that they're relying on, does some additional research to see if there's other things that need to be taken into consideration and then lays it all out for me and for the other two judges who are going to be on the panel deciding the case so that we have a common basis for discussing the case when we get together before the oral argument is heard. In every case, uh, the lawyers argue to us by means of their briefing and that can, can be comprised of up to 75 pages for one side of the case and up to 50 pages for the other. And then in other, in some cases, but uh, not all, uh, we hear oral argument where we actually converse back and forth with the lawyers. What that means is that lawyers should not fall into the trap of being prepared to come and deliver a speech to the court. It's much more beneficial to their clients if they start in an organized fashion, but are able to readily pick up 
from the questions from the court. What is it that the judges are concerned about? It seems to me the history is relevant in looking at you know what the party's expectations were. Well, I, I have I two tips no for lawyers at oral argument. The Listen to the, the questions the asked by the judges and to answer them, not to dodge or uh, reflect away from them. Uh, the second is to not recite the facts of the case, and, but to get to the legal issues in the case because the judges will have read the briefs and are familiar with the facts. Please rise. After oral argument, the three members of the panel discuss the case in a conference. In any case, regardless of whether it's oral argument or no oral argument, the judges will sit all three together, talk about the case, and decide how the decision will come out. And then the person who's assigned that case will write the opinion. Sometimes all three judges agree, and it is written as a majority opinion. Sometimes there's a disagreement among the three judges, and so there would be a concurrence where two of the judges would agree and then a dissent written by the judge that disagrees. And we try really hard as a group to come to a consensus where all three agree, uh, which means a lot of discussion of trying to understand each other's points as to why there's disagreement on what point and how the law. Sometimes we're, we're pulling up cases to try to clarify issues for each other. Um, but there does reach a point where we, we decide, okay, more discussion will not be beneficial. One person will write a dissent. Sometimes we have a concurrence where two judges agree that this is the right analysis for the case, and then there's another judge that agrees with the outcome, but not how we got there. And so that judge will write a concurrence. Court of Appeals decisions or opinions may be published first on the Internet. If the panel believes the decision has precedential value, it is also published in printed advance sheets issued every two weeks and later in bound print volumes. Precedential would mean that the lower courts need to follow it. The decision of that panel is of precedential value. It certainly controls the case in front of the, the court, but it also, uh, if published, um, has value statewide. I'm in the courtroom every six or seven weeks for one or two days at a time. The rest of the time I'm sitting at my desk reading everything the attorneys have given me to read, uh, everything my law clerks have thought is worth my knowing, and then I'm reading the works of my uh, comrades, the other judges who send their opinions around. We seldom see attorneys and we even less often see anybody who's not an attorney. It's a writer's life, really. Is your job boring? Oh, it's not boring at all. I. Um, I wouldn't be here still if I thought it was boring. I, I'm always surprised to find that there's some idea that a, a, a case brings up, uh, some new issue that I've, I've really n not heard of before or had to explore. Even the familiar ones um, come up in the context of very interesting facts. I mean, the, the, the facts of the cases that we deal with um, as appeals court judges are, are really fascinating. I mean, the lives of people and the the problems that they get themselves into and, and, the, and the difficulties that people have in, in trying to get those problems resolved. So Mr. Gorey, your next court date with us, sir, is July 11 at 8.30 a.m. In the two trial courts, you are literally out front every day and you're trying your best to deal with people fairly and pleasantly, but there is a, a certain sameness to day after day sometimes. In the appellate court, it's much different. The, our primary place where we work is actually in our chambers, in our offices. That's where we do our research. That's where we do our writing. That's where we conference amongst the judges to determine how we're going to decide a case. And substitute Senate Bill 6055 will be returned to second reading for the purpose a of amendment. A judge, unlike a legislator, does not create law and must abide by the statutes enacted by the legislature and rulings of earlier courts. As a member of the judiciary, you don't get to do what I did in the legislature. You don't reach out and fix problems. You respond to the case that's in front of you. You're basically trying to make sure that the lower court follow the law. You're trying to make sure there's sufficient evidence to support the facts. You're trying to make sure they got it right. 
uh, the Court of Appeals is a safety net. And uh, that's a role very unlike the legislature where you get to make policy and create the structure Thank for you, government. Mr. President. Yeah, conversations about race and racial disparities are really hard to have. The mindset um, of a legislator certainly is different from that of a judge because in the legislature you're representing people. You're trying to achieve what your constituents would want you to do. Um, you're trying to see that their interests are taken into consideration. As a judge, um, that you're not representing anybody. You're trying to be a fair decision maker regardless of the issue that comes up. And so you may, in a case, have to rule against uh, someone who's presenting the same issue where if it had been in the legislature, you would have voted for it. The Court of Appeals is bound to follow state Supreme Court decisions on state law and United States Supreme Court decisions on federal law. I think every judge comes to a case with a sense of justice and fairness, but what does that mean in each individual sense? And that's where you have to be careful that you're not just deciding a case based on your own particular morals, um, although that's very important. We have to decide the cases based on the law and the facts before us, taking into consideration all of the circumstances. But we don't just decide the case on a gut feeling. A court of appeals decision can affirm the outcome in the superior court, reverse and remand the case for a new trial, or reverse and grant judgment to the losing party at the superior court level. Even if the Court of Appeals finds an error in the trial court proceeding, the Court of Appeals may affirm the trial court decision if it determines the error to be harmless. If there is a reversal, the case is usually remanded for a new trial. The definition of justice may be something a little different for every judge. Uh, my definition of justice is the parties have come before court uh, knowing what the rules are, knowing what the law is, with a full expectation that they're going to be heard and that their case is going to be decided according to those rules. Um, that's my idea of justice, and I think that happens here every time. We try to give people a fair hearing. We try to decide their case based on precedent and based on the law. I think of the law, you know, a as a fortress. It stays very firm. It stays, it's reliable. Um, you know, sometimes mistakes are made and they kind of fall away as time goes on but on the whole you know we're following the law and and some really bedrock principles we follow the bedrock principles that everyone in court is entitled to a fair hearing an impartial decision maker they don't see it as they go about their daily lives but the fact that you can take your money and put it in the bank and expect to get it out again the next day is the result of judges all over the country being faithful to the law, even if they would like to be sympathetic to somebody. Um, you know, the various systems and institutions that we have won't work if you can't rely on the law. The profession of being an appellate judge carries anomalies and contradictions. A judge wants to issue a prompt decision, yet reflect before printing an opinion. A judge wishes to be brief, but yet be thorough. A judge wishes to exercise creativity, but also write with clarity. A judge might wish to ignore frivolous arguments from litigants, yet desires each litigant to receive a full hearing and know that he or she has been heard. A judge wishes to collaborate with his or her benchmates, but also wishes to project his or her voice. A judge wants to uphold convictions for crimes committed, but also desires to uphold the accused's constitutional rights, even if upholding those rights may lead to public criticism. A judge wishes to meet justice, but bestow mercy. A judge wishes to stand for principle, but not allow his or her personal bias to dictate his or her judgment. The staff and judges of the Court of Appeals look forward to another 50 years of diligence, integrity, and excellence as we continue to announce and apply the law, administer justice to litigants in the state of Washington, and serve our role as the intermediate appellate court and the workhorse of the Washington State appellate system.